if you would, this morning to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. We're going to read just one verse out of Philippians, and then we're going to go to the Gospel of Luke a few books back and read a couple of verses there. This important subject I want to speak on today, we need Him. We need Him. Philippians 4, I'm going to read one verse. In verse 19, Philippians 4 and verse number 19, it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now go back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. This will be a great, great companion passage to use. Luke chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. I'm not going to read the whole context. Just get into Jesus' words here. Luke 5, here's Jesus speaking about this need. He says in verse 31, And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole, or healthy, need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's pray together, please. God and Father, we humble ourselves totally in need of You. Help us all to see through the message today that, Lord, we cannot do life without You. Alone, we're miserable failures. We need Your help. God, I pray You'll show every person in this room their need, the unsaved, that they need Christ to be saved, Every Christian that we need you every hour. Help us, Lord, to realize that all every good and perfect gift comes from you. Thank you for the music we've sung and prayers, the giving, the fellowship already we've enjoyed. Speak to our hearts during this message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. If anything describes mankind, it is that we are all needy. We're born needy, we die needy, and in between we try to get those needs met. We all might define needs differently because what some person might call a need, another person might call a want. Can I live without such and such? Can I live without so and so? Really, a good definition of a need might be this, in the strictest, strictest sense of the word, something we cannot live without. Now, I don't talk about just physical living either. I'm talking about emotional and spiritual life as well, a sense of worth, a sense of value, a sense of contentment and fulfillment. Do you know that the whole world really runs on needs? A business guru who does business, business seminars for small businesses and even large ones wrote something I read a while back that I thought was very interesting. He said, quote, the customer never buys a product. By definition, the customer buys the satisfaction of a need. To put it another way, there are no markets for products, only markets for what products can do. Xerox, he's going back and giving an example of a very successful company, successfully pioneered the copy, mach uh, copy machine industry by leasing copiers at a per copy price rather than selling machines outright. They correctly saw the market was not for co uh, machines but for copies. Four implications, he's given this in a seminar setting. Number one, we must constantly evaluate customers' needs. Number two, we must design products to meet specific needs. Number three, we must redesign products as needs change. Number four, we must delete products that no longer meet customers' needs. I thought, you know, that's good business sense, but it's real life sense, too, for people to realize. Now, one of the greatest differences between a Christian and a non-Christian is that a real Christian has gotten their needs met in Jesus Christ. But the non-Christian is still looking. Now, that does not mean, I have to say, that uh, every Christian uh, is void of thinking they ever have needs. It's not like every Christian ever thinks they, they have a 
need for anything because, let's face it, sometimes in our flesh as believers, we still have that old sinful, selfish flesh. We forget who we are in Christ and we still think we're needy. On the other hand, it doesn't mean that even every non-Christian will always feel or think that they uh, have needs that are going unfulfilled. And yet the reality of both is true. And so I used two short verses or passages in the New Testament that both spoke of needs. One of them was for the Christian. One of them was for the non-Christian. When Jesus said to non-Christians, they that are whole have no need of a, of a physician, but they that are sick. He stated a very easy to understand truth and principle. You're never going to take medicine. You're never going to go to a doctor unless you feel you have a need for one. And that's the same with the gospel. No sinner has ever turned to Christ. No person has ever come to the Lord to be saved from their sins who did not realize their desperate need. But then, for Christians, Paul himself wrote, as we read there in Philippians, my God shall supply, and he's writing to a, a church at Philippi, all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. The thing that separates the saved from the unsaved is that we that have been born again, we have seen that we are needy, we have sought help for our needs, and we have found the source for our needs being met. His name is Jesus. My job today is very clear. It is to help you see that you are needy and appoint you to the one, the only one, that can meet your needs. Your husband can't meet them. Your wife can't meet them. Your family can't meet them. Your job can't meet them. Your looks can't meet them. Your health can't meet them. None of these things that people are looking for or out in the world to meet their needs will ever truly satisfy. I heard of a ministry, this was a very encouraging statistic I read about a ministry, I hadn't even really heard of them, but in doing some research in, about needs, I heard about a ministry called Need Him Global. And what I read was astounding. It said that during COVID, the last two and a half years basically now, they received over 500 million contacts. Now, that's not all direct, like talking on the phone, but that's through social media and through different avenues of their connections with people. 500 million contacts from over 170 countries. I thought, man, praise God. That means some 500 million people were at least interested to some degree about Jesus Christ. And him being the only way to have their needs met. Boy, I'll tell you, that, that COVID crisis we have went through and in some ways are still dealing with really made us all think, didn't it? Kind of changed our perspective on life. It should have. I hope it did for you. It makes us realize how puny and, and really kind of irrelevant we are, we seem to be at least in the overall picture of how the world lives and, and acts. But I'll tell you, it made us see how much we really need Him. We need someone greater than ourselves. We need someone greater than the government, greater than what the world can do. You've got to see, friend, that only Christ can meet your needs. And so to help you to see that today, I want to remind you of about 12 areas, 12 ways in which you and I need Christ. We don't need the world. We need Christ. First of all, we need His answers. We need His answers. You know, every one of us is born with questions and we ask questions all our lives. And if you don't ever get your main questions of life answered, you're going to die disappointed and discouraged and confused. We all have questions. I told you about my favorite little gospel booklet I used to use. It's not in print anymore, but it's called Ultimate Questions. But I've used the principle many times. All of us have four ultimate questions we ask. And I am challenging you today to find that Jesus Christ is the answer to all of them. He's the only one that has an answer for all of them. 
Number one, where did I come from? We all ask that. How did the world come into existence? You either believe in the lie of evolution or the truth of creation. Secondly, why am I here? What is our purpose for even being alive? Why am I taking up space on this earth in 2022? What's my purpose? That's a question we have to answer. Number three, how am I supposed to live? I mean, we all wonder, am I doing right? Am I wrong? Am I a good person? Bad person? How am I supposed to live? Only God has the answer to that. And then ultimately, number four, or the final question, where am I going when I die? You need an answer for all those questions. And I challenge you that only Jesus Christ and His Word, the Bible, that He inspired and gave to mankind, will answer all those questions. We need Him because of His answers. Number two, we need Him because of His grace. We need His grace. What I mean by grace, grace means the unmerited or undeserved favor of God. Why do we need that? Because we don't deserve His attention, let alone His love. When you think of how all of us as sinful people have rejected God and went our own way, Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to His own way. When we think of how sinful we've been according to God's commandments, we realize we are in total need of His grace. Paul beautifully wrote it in Romans 5 and verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Grace is one of those beautiful words. Our friend Johnny, I don't see him here today. I wish he was here, but he brought a devotion yesterday and he mentioned one of his many points of interest that he had in the Bible is how grace is mentioned first in the Bible with Noah. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord early in the Bible. And all through it in Scripture, we see grace. We need grace. I'll tell you, once you realize how sinful and, 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 and disconnected your life is and my life is, once I saw how sinful and wicked I was and selfish and I couldn't do anything on my own, I realized I needed God to have mercy on me. I needed His grace to save me. Well, not only that, we need, thirdly, His atonement. Or, I'm sorry, His forgiveness. Let me do forgiveness first. His forgiveness and it comes along on the same line with, with grace. The reason we need forgiveness is because we are all an offense to God. We've all offended God so much. Now, again, remember, remember the point about Jesus saying that if you're sick, you need a physician. If you don't think you're sick, you, you won't. This point might not fall on accepting ears, but when you see your life as sinning against God and offensive to a holy God, then you will desire forgiveness. When you see you've offended your spouse, you've offended a sibling, a, a parent, a child, a, a close loved one, a fellow worker, classmate, whatever. You know, when you offend somebody and you really know it, you know there's a, there's a split in that relationship. There's something that's happened. You know what you want? What you desire? Forgiveness. You desire reconciliation. That's what we need. We need His forgiveness. Oh, Paul again writes in another beautiful passage in the book of Colossians this time. Colossians 1 and verse 14. Paul wrote, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's the great work of salvation. If I was to say, what is being a Christian really all about? I mean, to boil it all down, it's being forgiven by the great God of the universe. That's it in a nutshell. It's being forgiven. It's going on having your sins taken away by Christ. Through His blood, that leads me to point four, which I wanted to mention. We need His atonement. His atonement. Atonement's a big word in the Bible. Now, it's not a word we use much in our common vernacular today, but it's an important word scripturally, and it means a covering. It means for God to cover your ugliness and my ugliness with the perfect righteousness of Jesus' life. Not only did Jesus die to forgive our sins, but He lived to give us a righteous life in place of our sins. I can't live good enough for God to love me, good enough for God to accept me, good enough for God to let me come into His kingdom and live eternally with Him. I can't live that way. Neither could you. We needed the righteousness of Christ. I need His atonement. I need His covering. That's why all through the Bible, beginning in the Garden of Eden itself, we have God Himself first killing an innocent animal, 
shedding its blood. What a gory, awful sight, you say. Well, it's supposed to be. God wants you to see how awful your sins are. My sins are. He wants us to see that without the covering of an innocent, pure sacrifice, we can't be covered from our sins. Our, our sins are going to show up, and, and right in his eyes, he's going to see them, and he can't have anything to do with us unless he covers us. Paul, again, Romans 5.11 says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement, the covering. And all through the Bible, you see those animals being sacrificed. It's because an innocent had to die for the guilty. Jesus was the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, who died as the perfect, innocent sacrifice for guilty sinners like you and I. Well, let me go on to another need. I've just given you a little bit on each one of these. We need His answers, His grace, His forgiveness, His atonement. We need His purpose. We need His purpose. Boy, this is a great, when I mention it, kind of is one of those ultimate questions, but let me go a little further into it. You know why we need His purpose? Because we don't really know what life's about without Him. We, we, we really would never get the big picture. If you don't think I'm telling the truth of that, look how messed up people's lives are who don't know Him. They don't even know what life's really about. Why we're even here. What we were meant to do. What we were meant to accomplish. What was meant to happen while we were here for whatever length of time we're here. See, we need His purpose. Christ gives you purpose. Before I came to the Lord 38 plus years ago now, as a young 20-year-old hoodlum, if you will, drug addict, I didn't have any purpose at all. My purpose was to get the next bit of drugs I wanted to buy for the weekend or do whatever I could to make myself feel good and self-medicate for a little while. That was my purpose. And after I went to jail a couple times for it, it showed that purpose wasn't really good. It had some real problems with it. But then I came to Christ. Oh, I found purpose. I found meaning to my life. And you can find purpose to your life too. Because that's what He gives. Romans 8, 28, the great verse on God's providence. For we know that all things work together for good. They don't stop there because they don't work good for everybody. To them who love God, to them who are the called according to His what? Purpose. His purpose. See, that's a wonderful thing about being a Christian, isn't it? I know no matter what happens, even if I can't understand it, I don't like it, I can't explain it, it doesn't matter. God says for His people, He is working out a grand plan that is good. It's all working for good. Well, this is a big one too. Number six comes right after this. I need His wisdom. I need His wisdom. Oh, man. Not only do we not know what life's about, but this comes on the heels of that. We don't even know how to live. We don't. I didn't know how to live until I came to Christ and had Him teach me and show me through His Word and by the example of His people and those who've lived before as well to set that example. See, it's through Christ that we learn how to live. We learn wisdom. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, James 1, 5, let him ask of God. That giveth liberty to all men and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Hey, God says, if you want wisdom, he'll give you wisdom. But you've got to ask him. And when he gives you the wisdom, you know what wisdom is? It's different than just the word knowledge. The word knowledge is a great word. Knowledge is kind of getting the facts. If you have knowledge of something, you know what it's about. Wisdom is applying the facts to your life. That's why the same book of James would say in the same chapter, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. He said, hey, when I give you these truths that are found in my word, then you better live by them. That's wisdom. I needed wisdom. Man, I and it's not that we still don't make mistakes. Christians still make mistakes. We still do wrong things. But you know what? It's not because of this book. It's despite this book. Because the book tells us how to live. It's when I don't live by the book that I still make mistakes that are not wise. Read the great book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs. And it compares and contrasts throughout the book. The foolish man and the wise man. You ought to read it in circle every time you see the word fool or foolish or wise and wisdom. And you'll see God has a way for you and I to live. 
Oh, I need him. I need to know how to make right decisions and right choices. I've made plenty of bad ones. You have too, I'm sure. But you know what? The closer you get to God, the more you grow in your faith, the less bad decisions you make. Now, we're still sinners. That's true. But God wants you to live an overcoming life. He wants you to live a victorious life, a contented life, a fruitful life. And you can through Christ. Now, seventhly, boy, these are huge. I need his help. I need his help. Man, do I need his help. You know why I need his help? Why you need his help? This is, this is, a, this is a deep statement, isn't it? Life is hard. <laughs> isn't it? Is there anybody here in this room who would deny that statement? Life is hard. I'm talking about hard for the Christian too, but we have a place to go. We have a refuge. We have a helper, a protector, a defender. Life is hard. We fall many times, even as Christians. I love what Hebrews 4 and verse 16 says. Let us therefore come boldly with confidence, not arrogance, confidence, under the throne of grace. That's where God is, and His grace. Remember that saved us, it's right there to help us too. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, one thing I found the longer I live and see where, the way people are, people who don't think they need help are fooling themselves. They're arrogant. Did you ever see rich people? I told you this story. I'll just use it as a just basic illustration. But when I was pastoring up in Columbus, Ohio for all those years, and there was a part of the suburb where we were at where we had a lot, of, a lot of pretty wealthy people. I mean, not rich, rich, but definitely middle to upper income. Now, I'd come up to these big homes in those days, back in the old days, you can come knock on doors and talk to people. I, I don't think I ever had, I can't think of one single person that was in one of those wealthy big homes that ever had more than 10 seconds to talk to me at their door. They weren't interested. Because, see, they don't think they need help. They think they got it all together. That's the arrogance of atheistic people. You know, atheists, you, you know what, why atheism is just really pure arrogance. They don't think they need any help. They got it all together, they think. But you know the old statement, there's no atheists in foxholes? Very true. Wait till they stand at the moment of death and see if they have a need. They will. See, I need help. You need help. Jesus is the only help that we can find. The great Will Durant wrote Lessons of History. And listen to what he said in his book on Lessons of History. As long as there is poverty, there will be gods, little g. The inference is that people who lack material goods will seek spiritual satisfactions. The converse is also true. Material riches bring spiritual poverty. Affluent youth who have been sheltered from suffering and poverty do not seek out the consolations of religion. Man, he was so right. He wrote that many years ago, actually, and that is proven in, in mission field after mission field today. Do you know why we can read those mission letters like we do every week and hear about all these people in third world countries, very poor countries coming to Christ? And while we're seeing very few in America or in Europe or other affluent societies, but I told you, people who have things think they don't need God. But well, I tell you, when you really see how helpless you really are, you'll turn to the Lord. I need His help. You need His help. Number eight, I need His protection. I need His protection. I'll tell you, we live in a scary, scary world. Man, it doesn't take anybody very long to stay up on the news or check out a news feed on your phone or whatever it takes. It's not going to take you long to you realize, man, this is a scary, dangerous, threatening world. If you don't have a God watching over you, man, I feel sorry for you. God protects His people. Now, things still happen to Christians at times. That's true. I'm not saying a Christian doesn't ever die terrible death or a Christian can't die of an accident or a terrorist attack or a disease. Yeah, yeah, they die. But they die with the Lord. The unsaved die without the Lord. What a difference. 
Listen to Psalm 34, one of my favorite psalms. It says in Psalm 34, 7, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, that fear God, and delivereth them. Verse 17, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Oh, this dangerous world we live in, you need a protector. You need a defender. The Lord is that refuge. He's our rock, the Bible says. He's our helper. He's the captain of our salvation. I don't want to go through life without His protection. Do you remember when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and 1 Corinthians 5? There was a man in that church who was living in, in open fornication with his mother-in-law or stepmother. And you know what Paul said to the church there? As this guy was gloating on this sin he was living in. Paul said, kick him out of the church. Dismiss him from the church. But here's the key. That he might be delivered unto Satan. There was protection in God's church. He said, you kick him out of the membership, he's at the mercy of the devil then. You think the devil's merciful? He's not. Boy, boy what a statement. That means being a Christian as well as being a part of a family of believers, there is special protection here that's found nowhere else. Ninthly, I need his joy. I need his joy. Oh, I tell you, life is not only hard, but it's, it's frustrating. It's sad. It's lonely. It's hurtful. You know what God saves us to do? To give us a new perspective on life. To give us joy. Joy is one of those great words. Our granddaughter, they named her Joyella, but you know, we always call her just Joy. She's a joy to our lives, but she's joy. We need joy. The great book of Philippians, I took our, one of our verses from, the book's all about joy. But I want to read 1 John 1, 4, which I love. 1 John 1, 4 says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. God wants you and I to have joy, Christian. And people that don't have the Lord will never find real joy. Like I said, they're, they're struggling and running around to and fro trying to get satisfaction, trying to find some purpose, trying to hold on to something like an anchor to keep them from drowning in this world and all its problems. You'll never find it without Christ. He's the joy of life. I think about what's happened recently like down in Uvalde, Texas with those parents of those 19 children that were killed. And by the way, things happen in the world because God gave free will to man. People want to blame God. Oh, no, there's no God. If there was a God, why would all those things happen? Would well, you want God to make you and I robots or nothing bad could happen? You'd have no relation with God or couldn't have it with no one else either. God made us volitional, willful creatures. And he let us live on this earth for a certain amount of time and, and per se, because he made us that way, let you do whatever you want. But there is a day of reckoning. There is a day to answer for all that. But let me go back to those parents. Man, how could those 19 groups of parents ever go on? I don't know who they are. I don't know much about them. read a few names, but I don't know if there's a Christian among them. I hope there are. I'll tell you this, I've seen and heard and read of stories, but the only way a person can go on with any sense of normalcy to their life after something tragic like that is to have the joy of the Lord, to have an eternal perspective. I'm going to see my little son or daughter again. There's another life, a better life coming. See, there's joy. He wants to give us joy. We need His joy. Hey, our number 10, let me go on number 10. We need His promises. We need His promises. Oh, man. You know why we need God's promises? Because we've been lied to so many times. The world's full of lies. Jesus said the devil is a liar. The father of lies. We're lied to every day. We don't even know how many times we're being lied to. By the media, by the government, by people in high places who do things for gain and greed. You know, I need a place, I need somewhere to go that I won't be lied to. And so I go to God. I go to His beautiful Word. 
The Bible says of God, He cannot lie. He cannot lie. We find in 2 Peter 1.4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Man, I need His promises. I can't stand when you try to put your faith in someone or something and it disappoints you. Doesn't it? People will. Principles will. World philosophies will. God won't. We need His promises to believe in. I'm almost done. Number 11. These are flowing right to the end here. We need His hope. We need His hope. You know what hope is? In, a, in, a, in a, just a short definition, hope is something worth waiting for. It's something you're looking for. You know, I'm hoping for things in my future. That means I'm waiting for them. And we can't live without hope. And Christ is our hope. We need good things to look forward to. We need good things to live for, things to believe in. When we're wrecked and ruined and, and disappointed and discouraged by the world and all its ways. Colossians 1 and verse 5 says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, Oh, His Word and His Gospel that's found in that Word is our hope. I can live because I have hope for my future. Do you have hope for your future? If you don't, you'll never find happiness. You'll never find contentment. You'll never find anything worth living for without hope. Christ is our hope. Paul would say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Lastly, I'll end with this one. And this is where it all kind of flows to. This is where it all kind of ends. We need His future. His future. You ever think about your future? I think about my future a lot. I think anybody with any kind of intellectual capacity ought to. You ought to be thinking about, you know, yeah, next week, next year, but... When am I going to die? What, what am I going to be doing before I die? What kind of legacy will I leave? How will my family be left when I die? I think about my future, but then I think way past that. I think about where I'm going. Life is so short, friend. You know it is. Rick Rust was just with us about a year ago. Not even a year ago, right? November. Yeah. Came and preached from this pulpit. Church planner, him and his wife Tammy came. We ate dinner with them in the back, back there. And even then, he couldn't eat with us. He had some problem, didn't know. He's eaten up with cancer. We prayed for him Wednesday night. He's on hospice, probably won't make it much longer. He's, he's younger than I am. He's in his 50s. And, you know, as I, I thought, and I didn't know Rick that well, but just meeting him that day, and I, I sent an email back to his partner in his ministry that, Told, told us about his conditions. Very, very uh, uh, dire right now. But I, I sent back and I said to his partner, you know what? We'll pray for Rick. But you know, I envy him, really. Rick's got a bright future ahead. Now you think, what in the world? What do you say that for? Rick's all right. Because when he leaves this world here soon, he's going to a much better place. I think about his wife, Tammy, and, and their kids and their grandkids. They're the ones that are going to have to struggle to go on. Man, we've got such a good future, Christian, with the Lord. Jesus wrote in those immortal words, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Man, there's a better world coming for the Christian. There is a heaven on earth. There's a heaven now where God dwells, but he's going to bring that heaven down to earth. And we that are saved are going to live forever and ever with him. Now, let me close and say, friend, do you see 
how much you need him. I, I'm trying to get you to see that. I can't do it in the flesh. I'm trying to give you his word on it. But that's, that's just the beginning. I hope if nothing else was accomplished today in this time, in this message, is for you to leave out of this place in a few moments and say, you know what? I better give a second thought to that Christianity. I better look into that person of Jesus Christ and start seeing what that Bible says. Because I do have needs. Everybody has them. But that's not the end, though. That's the beginning. That's a great start. You need to begin by seeing your need. But to have him, to have your need met, takes one more step. Boy, it's vital. Yeah, you got to see your need. You have to want him. A need becomes a want. Remember? They that are old have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous to repentance, Jesus said, but sinners. When you see your need, that's a start. But then you have to call upon him and say, I want you, Lord, to meet my need. And he promised to as many as received him. You've got to receive him. He's got to become a part of your life. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you have a need? Do you see your need? Now, do you want that need to be met? Even today, you could come to Jesus Christ. Come as a sinner. Understand that there's nothing you can bring. No good work you can do. It's not about going through some rituals. It's not about baptism. It's not about church membership. It's not about giving to charities. It's not about turning over a new leaf. That won't do it. It's Christ. You come to Him. bare, open to Him. Saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I've lived a wicked, sinful life. I've done my own thing. But I need you to forgive me, to save me, to change me, to work in my life. And I'm coming to you because now, not only, not only do I need you, but now I want you. And if you'll do that, friend, you can be saved. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Boy, we need him. We're going to have a time like we always do to let you think about that thought. And not just for these few moments with the music playing, but I hope you'll think about it throughout the rest of this day and onward. This is the greatest thought you can ever have. I remember when I first had it. Oh, it took a couple of months going to a little church like this because I wasn't raised in a Christian home. But man, the more I heard the gospel and heard about my life, the more needy I was becoming. Man. But, but it wasn't all bad. It was good because then I saw who could meet that need. His name is Jesus the Christ. Today, friend, you could be saved. If you'll come with a repentant heart and faith in Him and Him alone to save you, just call on Him. Like the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today could be your day of salvation. So after I pray, We'll stand to our feet. We'll take a few moments while the music's playing softly. We won't come around and bother anybody. We're not going to put you on the spot or push you. We don't believe in doing that at all. But we want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you have questions. Maybe there's other things that you just, you have doubts about. And I understand that. We live in a skeptical world. And we're open about these things here. We want to talk to you. I'll, I'll come to your home. I'll, I'll have you come to my office. My wife and I'll talk to you. We'll do whatever we got to do to meet with you. And spend as much time as we can. I give out materials to people all the time. Tell them, read these things. and Let's talk about it. We want to answer your questions. Because remember, your need has to become your want. You've got to want Christ. And ask Him to save you. I'm going to pray. Then it'll be your time. To get along with God where you're standing. And think about your need. Our Father, our God. We love you so much. God, you're so good. Your Son and the Spirit, one God forever and ever. Thank you that you've met my need and you've met the needs of millions upon millions of people all throughout time. And now in this little place with this handful of people, 
There's people here with needs, I'm sure. Unsaved people who need Jesus Christ. God, I pray, they'll see that need. It'll become a want and they'll call on Him to be saved today. For Christians that have you and obtained your salvation, yet, Lord, we forget what we have and we become needy too. So God, help us realize, as that great verse said, you'll supply all our needs in your riches in Christ. So Lord, help us to realize that you're in control of all things and you are the great need provider. Bless, Lord, this invitation. Speak to every heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Eyes are closed. Heads are bowed. We're not going to come around and bother anybody, but this is your time.